Hello, welcome to this Davos Agenda Impact Session on Building Net Zero Cities. I am Cristina Gamboa. I am the CEO of the World Green Building Council, and I'm very happy to be joining you as your moderator today. Thank you very much for the World to the World Economic Forum for this invitation in recognition of the leadership of the network of the World Green Building Council, 70 Green Building Councils, and our impact in catalyzing the uptake of net zero and sustainable buildings for everyone everywhere. Last year, I had the pleasure to join the board of the Net Zero Carbon Cities program at the Forum, which is bringing together 70, stake 70 stakeholders from over 10 different sectors, which are ready to work together to secure that cities all over the world transition to a net zero future. So in this session, we are very privileged to have you all join us because it's one of the hot topics this year as we go into COP26. Cities are acting, but do, do need to do much more to embrace net zero and decarbonize cities and the built environment. It is imperative that we all play our part and that we embrace the and, and deliver the, on the uptake of an integrated approach to be able to reduce emissions, crossing energy, buildings, and mobility. We will hear this in the session about a great report just published a few weeks ago on net zero carbon cities, which is available in the World Economic Forum's website. We will discuss today the much needed systemic change required to unlock that low carbon future. And we're very lucky to have here the experts that can take us on that journey so we can ensure that systems are resilient and that they improve significantly, significantly our health and well being. I do believe that 2021 is going to be a great year and it's going to be a wonderful year to advance the agenda on net zero cities. Last year, COP26 got postponed, but this year it's, it looks very promising as cities and uh, the built environment in general is going to be profiled in the official agenda of COP26. The built environment is responsible for 70% of global carbon emissions for, from final energy use, but has been fairly invisible in the climate discussions for far too long. So that is changing. And uh, without further ado, we will hear from our experts on why this is happening. The conversation today couldn't be more timely. And uh, we will have a, a session where the panel discussions uh, from viewers all over the world can watch also through the live stream of the forum's website. So we will have a detailed discussion later for registered forum members and partners. So as this uh, discussion unfolds, please stay with us for, for the full session. So a big welcome to all our panelists. We have with us today, Jan Pascal Tricoir. He's the chairman and chief executive officer of Schneider Electric, France. Francesco Staracci, chief executive officer and general manager from, an, from Enel, Italy. Welcome. Grace Fu Hai Yen, she's the Minister of Sustainability and the Environment of Singapore. We're very lucky to have you here today. Thank you. And Jan Suikens, he's the Chairman of the Executive Committee of Ackermans and Van Haren from Belgium. So, this is a great topic. 70% of global carbon emissions comes from cities. So, Francesco, I would like to start with you. As a fellow member of the board of the Net Zero Carbon Cities Program at the World Economic Forum, could you please share with our audience what is the focus of this program and what do you think are the planned outcomes that is going to make it a, a big difference from the perspective of achieving net zero? Thank you, Christina. Uh, I think you have already indicated why this is important. I mean, uh, when you said 70% of the carbon emission of the world come from cities, and that should not surprise us because that's also where most people increasingly decide to live. And the question is, why would the world change if cities do not? And what do we need to do to accelerate this transition worldwide? The, the obvious answer is that we have to concentrate on cities. There is an incredible concentration of technologies that is 
to be found in uh, some geological certification of legacy in our cities. We have things coming from centuries ago and things coming from last decade, and it's all mixed in there. So how do we transition into clean electrification, into ultra efficiency buildings, into smart energy infrastructure? How do we increase the circularity of the economy in cities? Talking about waste and, and water, materials, everything that we consume in our lives in these big cities. And the answers are very fragmented. Each technology has its own way and its own recipe and its own way to decide how to improve. But how can a city do it all together? So the question is, how can we harmonize and accelerate the trend that is possible in increasingly make our cities more efficient? And the efforts that we tried to put together is exactly this, to make it possible for a city to have a helicopter view of all the technologies that are available and harmonize their deployment into the large metropolitan area, increasing uh, the efficiency of uh, the city itself and improving the quality of life of, of uh, people living in cities. In order to do that, we started uh, putting together an incredible group of leaders uh, across industry within public domain, so city mayors and administrators, putting together this group and trying to assemble all kinds of inputs that we would look at in order to make this uh, city efficiency effort uh, the more synergic and the more holistic possible. All in all, we think there are uh, great possibilities. The global framework paper today um, that was published a few days ago addresses the framework in which we will try and, and move in the, in the next uh, 2021. Um, there is quite a large consensus that it is within reach and acceleration within, in, in cities in, in this direction. And I think that 2021 will be a year of delivery. We will uh, put down and work hard at a toolbox of solution, best practices, examples for inspiration, checklists. You know, what if we want the boring part of this? But I think it is not going to be boring. It's actually going to be useful. So the, the, the next step of this effort, having put together this big team and also a little bit the conceptual framework will be set down and write the toolboxes and the, and the efficient uh, practices that will make cities step ahead in this, uh, in this effort. Like, uh, like I said before, what happens in cities drives the development of the world. So that's the focus of our uh, effort in the next uh, 12 months. That's wonderful because also the world in, in some geographies is still urbanizing at a very high rate. So even for, for cities that are retrofitting, for cities that are planning to grow, right? It, there's, yeah. there's some key things and key considerations that can change the future, right? And also address the past and address the carbon budget we already have built there in cities. And let's not forget there are many different archetypes of cities, small, large, all new. Uh, growing, not growing. Uh, it, there's plenty of different uh, situations in cities. They all have in common the fact that technology enables today in cities incredible improvements in quality of life and efficiency in energy use. Totally. And we have the winds of the clean energy transition yeah. behind us, you know, which is very favorable. Thank you so much for those considerations. Jan Pascal, welcome to this session. So your, from your perspective also, could you please share why you feel that this decarbonization of cities is so critical as a, the integrated approach that you're advocating in this way, paper? Yeah, hi, Christina. And, um, building on what Francesco introduced, yes. I think the, the, somewhere the, the passion of, of the group working together is about making things happen, right? Because I believe that today we are all convinced that our cities have to be better and have to uh, uh, put together a journey toward net zero. Uh, but the question is that a city is a sum of systems which are all intertwined. And if you move one of the subsystems without moving the, the rest of the system, then you go nowhere and actually you limit the results of, uh, on your objective or your capacity to reach your objective. So 
make it simple. We want things to happen, and now it's time for action. Though trying to focus on practical toolboxes for all the stakeholders that participate to the journey to net zero to work together. So we've been working, if I try to simplify, around four topics. The first one is to make sure we map the connections between the different critical systems related to uh, decarbonization on journey to net zero. Today, systems are often siloed. Of course, digitization, smart cities, smart grids are helping to connect the dots, but it's still a sum of very siloed systems which, which don't communicate enough to drive to a coordinated on, on impactful change. So first point is we are making sure we are trying to work with a group to put together a clear mapping of the most critical connections of the subsystems so that they progress together. The second one is to work on a practical grid of analysis to help urban stakeholders to understand where they are and where we are on the net zero journey. For the authorities, for the mayor, for the city, or for the communities, it's a tool to assess and benchmark the degree of preparation of their assets and infra. But for the financial actors, because there is a lot of capital nowadays who would like to finance uh, the evolution of infrastructure, it, and, and they sometimes wonder how they can really qualify that an investment is going into the right direction or not. It's a tool of common dialogue between cities and between sponsors uh, to make things happen. So let's say a common grammar on referential to make sure that we, um, everybody has the same understanding or a common understanding of the journey. Let's say that this has happened in, in the building space in, uh, in the past years with a number of certification which have been adopted by many cities, expanded to the environment of the city to make sure that there is a more global understanding and more global sharing of what's happening. The third point is about best practices. I mean, people around this, this call in this group are building a ton of good solutions, uh, progress solutions that can be shared better and create the right exchange place so that people can get inspiration on cookie paste of the best solutions which have been uh, uh, deployed. And finally, the fourth point is really understand what are the links um, with other collaterals. When we do that, what could be the other benefits that we can generate and try to put to qualify them? Uh, let's make an example. Uh, at the rate of retrofit of the cities, let's say just one example in Europe, cities will be retrofitted for their building in, in 200 years at least, which of course doesn't fit uh, with, uh, with a 1.5 degree trajectory. Using new technologies on a new way of doing, we can reduce that by a factor probably of 10, which makes it 20 to 30 years much more acceptable for all of us probably uh, around, this, um, around this call. So how do we address this acceleration of retrofit? What are the additional jobs to be created to make it possible? Um, how can we uh, associate that to a request which is special in post-COVID is coming up like health, well-being, uh, uh, the necessary, uh, well, the evolution of buildings on, on common spaces so that they become more healthy. Those are the things that we would like to approach and illustrate the correlation uh, together with the main topic of net zero cities. So in, um, in a nutshell, this, these are the four points on which we are focused at the moment. That's excellent, because there's a great demand for transparency from data. You mentioned, as I said, there were the winds of the clean energy transition picking up. There's also the winds of the responsible investment movement. And this transparency and accountability of investments in better assets also requires cities to address digitalization, right? And, and that I would like to follow up from you were saying that digitalization trend is also at the forefront in the, in the times we're living. So that, that access to data in that systemic approach, right? Um, you said was, will be unlocking opportunity for citizens, for public policy makers, and also for business to better address what are those needs. What do you see this happening in terms of the uptake and how do you feel the systemic approach can unleash <coughs> the power of the digital transformation? 
Well, frankly, uh, uh, Christian, I believe that digitization is a fantastic disruption now that it is applying to the Internet of Things. That means connecting our cities to the citizens of the cities and connecting the various subsystems of the cities together. Uh, it is somewhere the technology enabler to a better systemic efficiency. And it was not existing before. So we shouldn't take it lightly. What was not possible before is now possible. So I'm going to be very quick because I'm sure that many people have, have to speak around this round table, but think about it. With digital, you can measure everything. On inefficiency, what you measure gets done. Uh, measurement is a base of progress. It's a tool for efficiency everywhere, in buildings, in all networks, uh, really everywhere. It's the necessary connection between silos, between uh, renewable generation into a super efficient and modulated buildings into a smart grid that allows us to share better. It's a place where you can share data between the stakeholders. Take the building example between the design house, between the contractor, between the utility, between the user. Suddenly you have transparency of what, uh, what on, on people working together on the improvement, the betterment of the same facility. It's a way to connect people to the city. I mean, to know if there is an available parking lot in this parking, if I can go to a canteen because there is free space, you can really share better and be more efficient. And it allows for traceability of resources. Therefore, this is a first pass to circularity. So getting things connected is really essential to this progress. And that was not possible before, but the recent takeoff, fast takeoff of Internet of Things, big data, artificial intelligence, plus mobile tools, make that this, this, this space is evolving very fast. Totally. The transition has been amazing. We're very lucky amidst the disruption that has a very positive trend that has emerged. Thank you so much for sharing those thoughts. Minister Fu. In terms of the experience and the leadership of Singapore, Singapore it has been a great, um, yeah, let's say proposer of solutions in this space where sustainability has been key in the development of, of the city state. Could you please uh, give us one of the key lessons from your perspective that has accelerated a better performance of the city in terms of continuing to address its agenda in climate action, in decarbonization, and what is your big challenge in the months to come? Thank you very much. That's a great question. And, you know, look, just hearing Francesco and Jan Pascal, it's, it's so inspiring to see so many people thinking about this important issue. I mean, Singapore is a city, but at the same time, it's also a country. We are only 700 square kilometers, housing five and a half million population. We are very renewable energy constrained. So we have many, many challenges. <laughs> if you, Christina, if you give me the time, I can tell you the, the tons of challenges that we have. Um, but because of our constraints, because of challenges, we, we are forced by circumstances to always think out of the box. And I think many solutions up there in other countries, in other cities, are really good examples for us to, to consider. And if you think about it, it, the um, advantage of Singapore really because of our smallness, because a lot more integrated, our decision-making is also very comprehensive. I would like to think that we are very data-driven. Uh, just taking John Pascal's uh, you know, uh, point about really giving us the data to work on, we'd like to have data from different systems to let us understand the um, you know, total carbon footprint that we have. So I like to think that Singapore government is really doing the other things that the citizens of the cities are doing as John Pascal has described. We want to make those data transparent to the people. We like to think about our plans in a very holistic way. Sustainability actually, is, as Francesco has said, is so integrated. It's not just the work of one single ministry or one single agency. It involves so many aspects of our lives that actually you need all parties to come together. So we'd like to start with looking at our total carbon um, emission, sectorally analyze where are the big emitters, and then very systematically go through sectoral target setting so that all the agencies that are involved 
have a clear understanding of where the projection, where the trajectory, and how to get there in time. We also want to take a very disciplined approach to look at the cost benefits of technologies. There are so many technologies out there. Some of them are more mature than the others. So it's important for us to that not to lock into any technology prematurely. So we have a disciplined way of looking at the carbon abatement versus the fiscal cost needed so that we can come up with a very clear understanding of what are we to do, what are the steps to do. And most importantly, this framework actually allows us, the government agencies across the board, to have a common discussion about the plan. Let me just give you an example, looking at public transportation. Uh, we want to make public transportation a lot more carbon efficient. How do we intend to do that? We want to make a subway station 10 minutes away from 80% of our population. We want to move into electrification of our vehicles. By 2040, the entire fleet will be electrified. We also want to make our public fleet 50% of our buses to be electrified in uh, 2030. In order to get there, Obviously, we need our energy ministry to also think about supplying the charging points. Because it's one thing about having some parts, some electrical vehicles, but if you have to go 100% of your fleet electric to go on electric, it's going to distribute the electric points all the way, all around the country to every community. And that requires collaboration, requires agreement by all agencies and agreement with the community as well. Therein lies also an opportunity, as some of the gentlemen have said, opportunities for businesses to come in because the rules will change as technology disrupt the way that we do things. Do we still need to own cars? Can car sharing be more prevalent? So are we able to reduce wastage in capacity of vehicles if we are able to do car sharing a lot more? Where Charging points will become the sharing point. So there are many of such um, examples that will be very exciting for us as a city, as a country, over the next few years to look at integrating our policies, making sure that as we move collectively towards carbon neutrality, we are integrated, we are moving along with everyone, the community, the financiers, as well as all agencies of the government. That's wonderful. That's a great vision. And thank you so much for sharing with those those dates for, for the changes in EV vehicles. That's going to unlock also a better collaboration with other solutions and make it more integrated. So that's wonderful to hear. That's going to unlock a good revolution of cleaner solutions for the city. And uh, developing on that, now I would like to bring in uh, Jan Suikins. Hi, Jan. Uh, building on what the minister was saying, right, about also uh, making the points of transportation closer to having a better quality of life that you don't have to move around the city so much. Do you agree on, on, on that solution and how to better, uh, let's say, capitalize on those developments, right, to further the integrated approach? What do you think about those type of solutions? Thank you, Christina, for having us. Um... Uh, I would also like to come back to something you said early on. I think this is the ideal time um, to have this con these, these discussions. As you know, there is a lot of money available, public funds, as well as private funds, to invest in you know, ESG compliant uh, projects and building smart cities, building compact cities, uh, building sustainable cities certainly uh, answers to these um, uh, to these questions, but in order for um, for for that to happen, I think we have rather uh, to think in terms of neighborhoods rather than buildings, and we have to make sure that what we create is in terms of neighborhoods that they are livable, that they are sustainable, and that they are affordable. And what I mean by that is, and, and certainly the pandemic uh, crisis has learned that, 
we have to integrate all of the functions uh, as well. Uh, we are working, we are living, we are looking for our entertainment, whether it is sport or culture. Uh, we need to greener uh, our environments, uh, and all of that will help us making these environments more livable. Sustainable, resilient environments is even more important. And in that aspect, we have to think about a life cycle approach to both uh, construction as well as investing. And uh, which means that, you know, circularity, and it has been referred to, is becoming more important. Uh, making sure that, you know, we, uh, we use new materials, reusable materials. We make it, and, and our colleagues refer to it, our environments, our buildings more energy efficient. Yeah? And data will certainly help so uh, doing. Resilient, we have to use the existing space. We have to think about how to renovate existing heritage buildings. We have to think about how to re repurposing existing assets. We have to think about how to make sure that, you know, the available space becomes more flexible so that over time we can adapt the environments to new needs. And affordable, I think, and, and it was referred to uh, as well, uh, in we have to think about smart engineering and think long term as I mentioned, in terms of what, you know, how environments could change and how we, we would, would need to uh, adapt the exi existing uh, space. We have to think about modular building uh, so that, that, you know, it's cheaper to build as well. We have to think how to reuse uh, when we renovate cities, how we reuse uh, the existing uh, materials. Um, and then, as I said, uh, it's, it's, we have to make sure that the living spaces are become more mixed and we have to, in, to be more inclusive in terms of the housing uh, we, uh, we generate. So I think that it's, it's the right time. Public-private partnerships are looking for ESG compliant um, projects, uh, but we have to make sure that you know, we, you know, we, we create new environments and we have in, and we apply indeed what is being referred to in the study. We apply an integrated approach uh, to the problems that that we are facing. That they are and and that in fact are huge opportunities. You touched some very important concepts in your intervention. <laughs> All of you have, but I would like to flag a whole life approach, the whole life cycle approach, because. Any success in decarbonization and, a, and the integrated approach will have to think about the impact of the infrastructure, how we design and build today, and what the performance in the decades to come. You were talking about heritage. Heritage, we have to address how is it fit for purpose today. And possibly it's a very sustainable uh, infrastructure. It already exists, right? It probably has a carbon budget still to pay off. And we need to make it, a, let's say, a, 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 integrated into the functions of the city. So the lessons from Singapore, Minister Fu, a, also the city developments have been mixed use, quality housing. And I guess what we're talking here is about quality infrastructure in cities that can really unlock our best a, health and well-being while addressing the responsibility we have in terms of having cities meet the Paris Agreement and deliver, of course, on the Sustainable Development Goals. And, uh, and on the ESG criteria, of course, infrastructure has to disclose. People are being picky, more picky, in what are the, let's say, the ingredients that go into what they're investing on. And these type of solutions are the ones that are going to be quality infrastructure, that are going to have a green premium in terms of value, and uh, probably assets that are not addressing the questions that um, this approach moves forward, we'll have a brown discount. And as we move forward, we will have a virtual cycle where we can grow better solutions and, and technologies that in unlock this decarbonization of the built environment. Thank you so much. I guess uh, with that, we have a few, more, a few more minutes and I would like to go back to Francesco uh, in terms of if you could just say a, a few final words, what should 
key stakeholders, uh, let's say, commit to uh, in this new path forward towards decarbonizing, decarbonizing cities through an integrated approach? Thank you, Christina. And, and uh, again, uh, you've heard uh, incredible, uh, uh, um, let's say, perspectives here. And, and I think if you look at what happened, for example, during 2020, which we all know, uh, was a major disruption in the way in which we lived in cities, mostly in most parts of the world. Uh, you can imagine a city uh, in 2019, and then you can imagine a city now, and in between, we have a 2020 in which we experienced our cities in a completely different way. And we have all learned to live in these cities uh, in a completely different way. And so the, the, ref the reflection here is, how can cities adapt to ourselves? They have been doing that all the time. We have changed our, our cities in centuries. We have kept working at them. The question today is that we are doing it in a more conscious manner in the dimension of what impact the city has on the world. This is the first time, I think, in the history of mankind that we look at, it, at, we look at cities this way. The cities, the, the way in which we live in them and the way we use them and, and shape them, shapes the world. So the importance of what we do within cities is super important. And I think here, the, the lesson that we learned is that cities are like human beings, are like living organic uh, beings. They continuously change. The task for administrators of cities has never been more complex than it is today. I think it's uh, fair to say from uh, Minister Fu's intervention that you would argue that a city administrator should have also some knowledge of physics if he wants to do the proper job, which is not that normal most of the times. You have and jobs, you have knowledge of physics, you need to have knowledge <laughs> of biology, you need to have a lot knowledge of, things. of chemistry. <laughs> yes. Because I think this COVID has just, you know, imposed um, unprecedented challenges on us. And I would just like to say, I totally agree with you, Francesco, that the, the pandemic has actually taught us to make us think about the resilience of a city. Um, yeah. I think in the past, it's always about efficiency. It's about getting the work done faster, you know, getting to where we one point to another with shorter speed. Um, but I think right now it's about resilience, yeah. right? How do we have, how do we have um, better hygiene? How do we have better public health? How do we make sure that there's, you know, space for individual, for reflections? I think these are all very important points and obviously it's going to change the way that we work. Um, so, because right now I think most of the buildings in most cities are probably operating at half the capacity because people are working from home. And I think increasingly, you know, there's, there's you know, this thought about what do we do with this wasted capacity? The well, you can you can argue that you, the you can also. Is working. Yeah, the, the heating is working 100%, the cooling is working 100%, but it's only half filled. So, uh, IoT, how do we use Internet of Things, sensors to tell us where are the cooling, heating needed? How do we adjust it so that it is optimal and we can reduce the carbon footprint of, of buildings? I think these are all food for thought. And I think in Asia, in Southeast Asia particularly, the, the cities are growing, the population is young, and I'm sure you know, it will be good investment, many good investment propositions for financiers. Like and I think, now. yeah, and I think you can also make a point that while the office space is underutilized, the home space is overutilized. So there is another point that and is, you know, not how do we change purpose. our homes? <laughs> how do we change our homes? going forward. So there is a continuous adjustment that needs to, be, to take place. And here, I think, you know, the efforts that we have to put forward is, uh, was underlined by Jen. Uh, there is a public uh, private partnership space that needs to be broadened and, and brought to fruition. This is a word always used and not that much put into context uh, properly. There is a lot of resources and money available for this kind of effort. It, this is out of question. And there is an issue of uh, deciding um, and, and agreeing on metrics, not on single buildings, on neighborhoods, on cities, 
not on single technologies, on holistic technologies, but that cannot be measured, cannot be done. So I think uh, this was said very clearly by Jean Pascal. Today we have the tools, we have the digital dimension that helps a lot. Let's put it to work because it is really what will make it happen. And during 2021, I think we will try and put this um, learnings to, to fruition and provide some kind of baseline of tools to uh, try and help the administrations of cities to do their very, very, very difficult job. Amazing. Thank you so much. That exchange was part of why this topic is so important to address because there is a demand for those solutions. There they exist. There is the space to improve the qu our quality of life and the moment could be more, couldn't be more timely. So thank you everyone. Uh, this closes the first portion of the session. And I would like to thank our great panel for joining us today, as well as the audience that has joined us.